Uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I really am with a kind of kindred spirit here because first and foremost, uh, I have been a publicist and been in and around public relations just about all of my professional life, starting out as an apprentice uh, on a movie called Coming Home, which was a long time ago, but it did get nominated for Best Picture, so with the Academy Awards coming up Sunday. Working on uh, great projects has, and projects that actually get people to think has always been part of, part of my life. So I've been in marketing and marketing communications, publicity, public relations throughout a professional career that had its kind of uh, peak at uh, Sony Pictures where I was uh, head of marketing and communications for the digital division. And that was really interesting to be in the middle of an industry uh, transforming itself from a analog and preset era to navigating uh, a true digital transformation. And it was through the effort at Sony that I got introduced to the TED conference. Uh, I was at a PR and uh, marketing strategy council at Sony Corporation where all of the heads of uh, marketing and communications from all of Sony's US divisions would gather and exchange ideas. At that time, I was at a small division of the studio called Imageworks, which went on to become a visual effects and animation giant. At the time, though, we were just beginning, and I had brought in a little tiny clip of a movie called Stuart Little that I showed at that meeting as to how we were able to create a CG character as a star of a film. The head of marketing from a corporate level saw that, was in a dialogue with the founder at the time, or the, he was always the founder, but the gentleman who was running the TED conference, who had invited her that if she had ever saw, you know, if she ever saw something that would be interesting and worthy of the TED audience to please let her know. She saw that little clip, said, Don, I think you ought to send this to Richard. He saw it, and next thing I know, um, on a plane up to Monterey, and uh, just about all of the leaders of today's economy are sitting in that theater uh, watching uh, this little clip. Uh, so that was how I got introduced to TED. I was not all that familiar with it at the time, uh, but once you're there, it was, it, it, it's amazing the kind of impact that that can make. And since today is Today's topic is how to leverage a TED Talk. Uh, that was probably a first really good example of how to leverage a TED Talk because it started out certainly with something that was unique and special. I was able to then introduce it to an important audience. But what was also interesting was the people who were in that audience and the way that it was positioned. Thanks to that opportunity, though, a lot of influential people were exposed to that work and realized that there was sort of another step up in the kind of evolution of uh, motion picture production or what was even possible at the time. Uh, so much so that I actually heard uh, from people inside another animation studio uh, about 18 months later uh, where my Stuart Little presentation, I actually, I, I put the presentation together in all fairness. The president of the company actually was the person who talked it through on the stage. So uh, in a moment of embarrassment, I was actually the one introduced and then had to bring up my boss. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, rule of thumb. If, <laughs> if, if, if you're introduced and it's supposed to be your boss, you know, probably a good idea to make sure that at least the boss joins you, right? Because uh, <laughs> I wanted to go to more TEDs after that. Uh, but I, what, 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 I, what I had heard was uh, the, 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 the head of a competing animation studio uh, said, 
I think we should do, you know, we, should, we should take this project up to TED just like, right? So they were using it as a, as a platform as well. Uh, so the idea behind, uh, I'll talk about a couple of things and then because I know everybody has a lot of questions, I wanna make sure that I actually have an opportunity to answer your questions to the best of my ability. But I'll give you a couple of, couple of initial thoughts. Uh, one is, you know, not every, not every person is a TED speaker, and not every topic is a TED talk, and there really needs to be a series of reasons and questions that you want to ask yourself before you propose a TED talk. I uh, so in the next couple of minutes I'll kind of outline some of my thoughts on it. These are not hard and fast. I'm speaking from my own experience. I have, have certainly operate the TEDx Conejo under a license and guidance from TED, but I personally am not a TED employee. Uh, so you know, I do my best to coach, guide, counsel, et cetera, but uh, they are the final arbiters and I certainly, uh, you know, I get dinged when I don't have the right, you know, disclaimer or something on a piece of paper. So uh, the opinions that you are hearing are definitely, uh, definitely mine. Uh, let me tell you a few things that a TED Talk, you know, is not or should not be. It is not a sales pitch. It, there, it is a, an absolute sort of violation of the sort of TED guidelines to go out and aggressively sell your company or your mission or, or anything from the stage, which is not to say that if you haven't made a really remarkable discovery in the context of your work or your life or anything else that you can't talk about it. It's just that when you go and do, say, a corporate presentation or you're actually standing up in front of, uh, you know, anything from the Chamber of Commerce to a team of uh, executives or even going to some conferences where the whole purpose of being there is to sell your company, that's not what a TED talk is designed to do. So, as PR experts, part of what we need to do is figure out what we can say within a TED Talk. Why is it an idea worth sharing? And then, what are the things that we can do to make the most of that X number of minutes somewhere usually between three and a maximum of 18, and then leverage it beyond for our more business-specific mission. Uh, I will tell you, having programmed the TEDx Conejo event uh, going back to 2010, and the way that came about is my wife would always say that I would come back from TED like on a, a cloud. You know, it took several weeks for me to kind of come down off of that experience. My head was filled with ideas and energy. I just wanted to share them with everybody. And I used to get the, uh, before the talks were posted for free online, the only way you could actually see a TED talk was if, if you knew somebody who was getting the recorded DVDs that they used to send uh, after the conference. and. Uh, when they announced that they were going to be starting this TEDx program, I said, okay, well, if, if I can't get, because what we're, where my, my wife was active in the, you know, you know, as a parent in the school district here, and she was always saying, oh, it'd be great if you could get the teachers to TED. And I'm going, so, you know, I'm lucky at that time that the company was paying for me to go. Uh, you know, after they stopped paying, I was draining my bank account so I could continue to go. It's like, it's a struggle just to get myself there. You know, can't take the whole district, but guess what? With TEDx, I could bring TED 
to the community and create opportunities. And a big shout out to the Kenyejo Schools Foundation, <laughs> two representatives right here uh, who uh, supported it. I remember being at an eighth grade promotion ceremony and having a conversation with uh, Mario Cantini, who was then the superintendent of schools here. He had just heard Daniel Pink talk about a new kind of mind. And all I had to do was say, you know, Ted, let's do it together. And he was like all over it. And that's how we, uh, we, we started doing it. So uh, the idea there was always wrapped around the idea that the smartest person you know just might be living next door. And I wanted to create in this area an opportunity to surface really interesting people and ideas that were frankly homegrown and give them a platform on which they could articulate those ideas and share them with a much broader audience and also to see their ideas in the context of other interesting people and ideas. Uh, some of a national level or international level, others just uh, you know, neighbors. And it was always around that organizing principle that if we could just give a more global context to some of the things that were happening locally, it would be, it, it would be really interesting and uh, might produce some things. That said, I've gotten a lot of proposals. And a lot of people will you know, hit up a TEDx organizer because they know, oh, great, you, know, you get to put the TED name on it. And you know, that's going to be good. That's going to make my, 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 you know, my client, my business, my whatever. That's, that's going to be the platform that's suddenly going to take me from obscure to famous. And it's all going to be backed up on that brand you know, halo that comes with TED. Well, yes and no. And as soon as somebody kind of comes to me and says, you know, I have this business where I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a life coach and I, you know, I, I do this and that's okay. You know, I, you know, I'm a consultant professionally these days. I'm always looking, you know, for things, but it's not about, it, it's not about going up there to sell your own business. Uh, the best thing that can happen is to look for the thing that you may have discovered along the way. Journeys are often interesting stories. How did you get from A to B to C? I'm not a scientist necessarily, but some of the most interesting TED Talks have been about brilliant scientific discoveries that were as much about the process of connecting those dots on the way to the discovery and then having that aha moment when you realize the breakthrough. So we're in a sales and promotion kind of way. You're very specific to articulating kind of the value proposition of the business. Here, it's more like, how did you put ideas together? How did you put thoughts together? Was there some unique aspect you know, it, it, that, that you have discovered along the way? Or an attribute that is actually of value and applies much more broadly than, say, your next, next quarter or you know, the objective of having you know, another you know, box checked on the list of things to do. Uh, a great TED talk is, is often about understanding, seeing the world through somebody else's lens. What have they seen? What have they realized? Another aspect of TED Talks, and this is one of the things that I love about it, because people will sometimes say, well, Don, you have lots of good ideas and bring it into it. But do you know how sometimes people go on and on and on and you kind of lose the message in the process? A TED Talk forces you 
or forces your client not not to think small because if you are successful with a TED talk things can get very big very fast part of the reason that they can get very big very fast is because the talk itself is precise the probably biggest TED talk that I have had is actually a six minute talk, four minutes of which are video clips uh, on the sort of, it's a cinematic journey of visual effects. I have never worked harder on what amounted to about two minutes of talking in my life because it required research, it required talking to people. I had to distill 110 years of cinematic history in the area of visual effects and animation into four minutes of clips that were interesting and people hadn't necessarily seen in the way that I presented it before. And I needed to explain what we do, how we got to where we got, and the principle behind which we accept visual effects to be what they are. When I started out, I probably had a lovely half hour talk, but I only had two minutes to speak. And that timer is there. So by doing that, I was able to actually frame it so that if you listen to it, you actually get the point. So if you are ever preparing somebody for a TED talk, it's a distillation process. It is a matter of keeping things simple. It doesn't mean that the topic itself needs to be simple. It just needs that you should resist the temptation to jam pack all kinds of stuff into it. I will so tell you that I am guilty of it myself. The, <laughs> the, schedule that I've been on the last couple of weeks is in reference to a couple of talks that I was giving to uh, a symposium of library directors. And I worked with a coach to help me refine the talk. And she was brutal in terms of saying, Don, you've got tons of great ideas. There's like, you know, there's a two-day workshop program in all of the stuff you have here. But you'll overwhelm the audience. They can't take it all in. So let's look at each point and distill it to its essential notes. It's kind of almost like maybe a fine wine where, yeah, you can have lots of things in there. But at the end, it's very specific sort of notes and flavors that come out of it that you want to make sure to land so that the audience can take it away. Also, just in a general, general way, ideas don't necessarily have to be so stunning that they're going to set the world on fire. However, even if we're local and it's interesting, it, whatever is said should apply elsewhere. TED is an international platform. It is accessible just about everywhere in the world. And part of the magic of TED is that it really doesn't matter where people are accessing the talks from. There are ideas that are going to resonate everywhere. Or if not everywhere, elsewhere, so accomplishments. The other thing is that there was perhaps a little bit of a temptation, and I know sometimes I have to ride the balance both on our event, our you know, full-on you know, multi-generational event that is the TEDx Conejo or salons that we'll do uh, coming up this year another big event hopefully, but also on the uh, youth event. Because 
sometimes there's a little bit of temptation to say, ooh, a good TED Talk is about overcoming an adversity. So you know, there, and, and the overall TED conference a number of years ago actually sort of almost fell into that trap where it was on the borderline between being a really interest conference of thinking and thinkers and doers and a telethon for you know some kind of you know uh, necessary you know cause and while that's all important it doesn't necessarily have to be a talk about I faced the trauma and then I recovered uh, but you know you look at some someone like say a Brene Brown who started out at a local TEDx event and has pretty much gone on to not only change her world, but change the world for a lot of people because what she is talking about was universal in terms of uh, its theme. The, 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 the core of what she was talking about was something that was relatable to many, many people. I guess the last uh, sort of thing is about how to leverage it. And it's really about sort of treating your, your business goals and the talks goals as kind of separate, uh, separate entities. You can leverage the exposure of doing a talk, but I would say that your motivation for doing it really should be, is this topic worthy of the organizer's time, the audience's time, or and you know anyone else's time that they take to watch it. Because there's a TED brand there. It really does need to stand up to a level. And it's actually in everybody's interest that that level of quality be maintained. Because if it isn't, then it dilutes the, the, the qualitative level of TED. And that's not going to help anybody. You want to have TED.com and you know, your person's TED talk in the company of greatness, not in the company of mediocrity. So step one is you know, ask yourself, is it worthy? And if it's not worthy, keep asking questions of whoever you are working with. Because here's the other thing I believe. Almost everybody has an interesting TED Talk inside them. I'll tell you a story from our first TEDx Conejo. We're sitting around. I was active in uh, one of the advisory uh, groups uh, associated with the schools. And there was uh, uh, one of the parent volunteers who had a financial services company and uh, wanted to be supportive and also wanted to give a TED Talk. Well, first off, you can't sponsor and sort of pay your way onto the stage. So that's a big no-no. Sponsors, if you want to have somebody speaking at TED, don't immediately sponsor that event. You want to get to know TED, I, we, do live on, <laughs> we do live on donations and ticket sales. Conejo Schools Foundation collects our money. So anybody wants to you know, get involved and sponsor, that doesn't disqualify you. But uh, the, the programming and the sponsorship really are you know, very separate things and always should be. Uh, but in this particular instance, uh, you know, he, the, the gentleman had mm, kind of a financial services platform that he showed me. And, it was fine, but it wasn't like a breakthrough. But I noticed that he had an accent and might not have been born like next door. He might live next door now, but he wasn't born next door. And I started asking him what his story was. And his story was really quite remarkable. And I had no problem with him mentioning how he got from where he began, which was a pretty amazing immigrant tale to you know what you know how, you know where he came from and you know how he he got there that was an interesting story filled with all kinds of twists turns adventures and you know frankly hard work and determination that was kind of the frame for a decent you know talk uh, so 
It's about sitting down, visiting with whoever it is who wants to give a TED Talk, and pulling that talk out. Uh, look at all of the other talks and sort of figure out what are the best ones. There are common denominators. And then you know, use your judgment as to where your person fits within that framework. Now, once they've given a great TED Talk, then of course you can leverage it. Uh, you can promote it. You can share it with people. It's an honor to be selected. And should one be so fortunate as to have that talk actually hit out of the park and make its way all the way to TED.com, then you know, amazing, extraordinary things can happen or not. I don't want to say that it's all altruistic, but a lot of it actually kind of begins and ends with intent. Why are you doing it? Simon Sinek, you know, has the famous talk about, you know, why. And that is kind of his business. It is his platform. But he didn't compose that talk to get on TED. He composed that talk because that's what he really believes is the absolute essential guiding force that motivates people to do their best. The idea is important. The idea is worthy. It's valid. So really, is that when you have a valid idea, then that is an idea worth spreading. And if you can tie it, tie that talk to whatever the individual is doing uh, in a professional way, uh, then that's a follow-on effort that is, that, it, that is done after uh, the talk is out there and becomes one of those things that everybody in communications has to have, which is a proof point. You got to back up whatever claim that you make. And what better way than, you know, with a talk that is actually getting viewed. And then, of course, the more people view it, the comments may be good. Uh, that just reinforces it. It's not you saying somebody's great. It's the world, frankly, giving you that, uh, that feedback. Uh, I'm sure you have questions, and I would rather before, I know I've got to get into town, and you all have offices and clients to deal with. So why don't I stop talking and take some questions, and I'm told that I need to walk to whoever wants to talk so that we can record your answer, or, or record my answer, your question. So questions. Okay. How do you start the process? What's the, the first steps? Once you come up with your great idea, then what happens? Well, the great idea, uh, the, the question is, what is the process? What happens once you have a great idea? How do you then get on to a TED stage. Uh, and let's talk primarily about the TEDx stage because getting on to the main TED stage is a whole other you know, thing and they have, uh, they have a, a team in New York and around the world that recommends people and a lot of them actually are going kind of through that TEDx funnel. So, Let's, I'll answer it in the context of TEDx. Uh, one is figure out where your local TEDx is. If you happen to be in this general geographic area, that would be me. And uh, it's uh, don at tedxconejo.com. Pretty easy email to remember, don at tedxconejo.com. Uh, that said, there are, you go to the ted.com website, and you can also look up other TEDx events, and there, there's an organizer associated with every single one, and there's a way to contact them on every TEDx organizer uh, or TEDx event webpage. So that's sort of step one. Step number two is get in touch, propose the idea. Uh, 
I would say before you do it, make sure that it's reasonably refined and that there is some credibility behind the, the speaker, uh, the topic, et cetera. Uh, the other thing is sometimes look for themes. Perhaps the topic relates to something and you can actually search on TED.com or just Google certain TEDx themes because most TED events revolve around themes. Uh, you know, and sometimes they're pretty broad. Like we had one called Energy and another was uh, uh, you know, Together. I, if we do another large scale TEDx Conejo event, it's going to be wrapped around the theme of listening uh, or listen. Uh, so there's a lot, the themes are usually around something fairly broad. The main TED conference this year was around the theme of dream and then they broke that down into different categories. So if there's a line there, it may be about proposing somebody to a TEDx event that is aligned with the theme that you have. Uh, and then, you know, frame it. Again, think of, you know, what is, you know, what is the talk about? What is the point? Uh, what makes it TED worthy? And then understand that even if it's selected, there will probably be a refinement process from there. Uh, even for the talks I've given on TEDx or the TED stage, it gets distilled and distilled and distilled. So anybody who you propose, if, if you're working with somebody who has that kind of ego that does not allow for any comment, that you know they are the perfect person and their words are golden and don't change a word, well, you know, maybe if you're Sir Ken Robinson, you can get away with it, right? But, you know, chances are, I think we all, we all benefit uh, from good editing, right? So be prepared to, you know, to miss out. But don't necessarily compromise the integrity and intent of why you're doing it. Uh, and then it's about follow-up. And it's, sometimes it's about patience, right? Uh, you may get feedback that says, it's interesting, but not right for right now. And that may not be that that individual or topic is bad or wrong. It just may mean just like when you're pitching something to a, uh, an outlet, right? Doesn't always fit. That doesn't mean that it's not good. It just means that it's not fitting within whatever editorial perspective they have. Well, they, they, they do for I'm just for curious to know if all of the um, TEDx groups are independently run and how they interact with TED. So are TEDx groups independently run? And yes, they are. Every TEDx event is an independent, independently organized TED-like event. And there are Kind of regional groups, like there's a group of us in Southern California who every, you know, like maybe once a year or so will get together. We're on, you know, there's a, uh, a pretty active uh, kind of uh, wiki kind of page. You know, there, there's a, uh, the TEDx hub is out there. So there are a lot of tools out there. Yeah, the application process, it's on uh, TED.com and it says, you know, participate or, you know, organize. And you've got to fill out lots of questions and it takes months to, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, go through that vetting process. And it, but they're all independent uh, and, you know, they're all over the world, but they're, you know, they're trying, they're being per, fairly careful in the way they uh, approve now, just because they want to maintain that standard. It kind of, you know, it, they never expected that it was going to get as big as it did. And that is not necessarily a problem, but it did kind of explode. Uh, I think there were like 3,000 TEDx events, or there are 3,000 TEDx events this year. So, you know, and in the year we started, there were 40. So, you know, it's like, really exploded. And 
as with anything when you grow you do have to manage that growth so that you can maintain the quality but you know i've seen you know i i was at a summit uh of tedx organizers uh, about three years ago and I, you're sitting there and it's like it's lovely out here it's great but i'm like with the guys who ran tedx you know in tunis uh, right around the beginning of the Arab Spring, or the guy who ran, you know, TEDx Baghdad and realized that the street that all of his participants had walked on like two weeks earlier got, you know, blown up, uh, you know, you know, like two weeks after his event. So, you know, they're doing this stuff in like war zones and mud huts, and uh, because the biggest thing, and me, this is what kind of keeps me honest is that there is a kind of hunger for ideas out there. There are people in some of the most difficult situations who are getting together and gathering around either a video or a group of, you know, ideas and, and speakers. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I, I want to honor those people as much by, you know, maintaining the, the quality and integrity at an event here because uh, it is kind of special, it is remarkable, and it is absolutely consistent with kind of the way the world is going. It's like one of those little bridges, you know. Yeah, not everything's gonna change the world, but it does. But, you know, it's pretty open. Well, thank you. Any other questions? I don't have to go back and forth. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Yeah, appreciate thank you. it, yeah.